Ähm, Dankeschön, Robert. Mein Deutsch ist schrecklich. Ähm, es tut mir leid, aber werden wir heute Englisch sprechen. Okay? Um, and English with an Australian accent. So, if I am going too fast, slow me down. Okay? <laughs> um, thank you very much for the invitation to visit. Um, I do visit a lot of countries, so frequent flyer miles are very helpful. Um, but I really visit those countries and work with universities around how universities are remaking themselves for the needs of today's society. And Germany, I think, is at a fascinating point in that trajectory. We had a conversation, I had a conversation with a colleague yesterday who said that Germany is kind of on the threshold. There is, there is a change that is happening. And the other thing that colleague mentioned to me was that there are now 2,000 young people working in academic development. 2,000 young people who need a career. <laughs> 2,000 young people who would like to look back at their work and say, I made a difference. What I'd like to do today is share a little bit about some of my research and some research from colleagues about how to make a difference. And I want to do that by telling you a story, a bit of an Australian story, so it might be a little bit different for your universities. Although, when you scratch the surface, universities are the same the world over. But it is an Australian story, so give me some latitude. <coughs> um, but I want to talk about four things, and I want to talk about them quite quickly, so apologies for that. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is the idea that if we're going to work with universities about change, we need to understand why they are changing. I want to talk a little bit about why universities are so interested, all of a sudden, in improving teaching. Because they're actually not interested, really, in improving teaching. They're interested in transforming learning. And that's the bit that I think is interesting. So we'll come to that first. The second thing I want to do is talk about some research that looked at how, you, how universities affect change in the educational space. And out of that research has come a bit of a blueprint for me about the ways universities need to think about systemic change. And this is the point where I say academic developers need to get over themselves. We need to realise that we cannot do it all ourselves. And we need to stop universities expecting us to do it all ourselves and then blaming us when it doesn't work. Number three. I want to talk about some ideas about teaching that I think might help to make the work we do a bit easier. And they're not new ideas, they're other people's ideas. I'm going to borrow from some other people's research. And the last thing I want to do is I want to talk about some ideas about learning from the research that would be maybe sensible for us to pay attention to as academic developers or members of faculty who learn. Because all too often, the people who do the teaching in universities about teaching do it in ways that break every single rule. Every single rule. So there's something about learning to be academic developers here that I want to pick up on. And in doing all of that, I'm going to focus at a very high level about the ideas about how you use research to design the whole university system. I've deliberately done that so it complements what Sari will speak about tomorrow which is a bit more about how you can use research in the actual work that we do, I think. That idea that we will try and give you a bit of the story from two perspectives, which is a game that Sari and I often play. We often end up speaking together. We have worked in very research-intensive educational development units for almost all of our academic careers, I think. And that's unusual, but it's why we speak from this perspective. All right, buckle up. <coughs> Here we go. <laughs> um, the first thing I want to talk about is the idea that there are some very major managerial and pedagogical drivers that are driving an interest in universities in education. Universities in Australia are big business. Big business. They are our fourth biggest export earner. That's huge. 
Universities are keen to make money, and they make money from teaching. They don't make money from research. In fact, most research-intensive universities in Australia cross-subsidise their research costs to about 20%. So our teaching pays for our research. At the same time, the resources that go into teaching and universities in Australia have gone up or gone down? Gone down. And they've gone down dramatically. Dramatically. At the same time, the participation rates in university have gone up dramatically. We have bigger classes, fewer teachers, and failing infrastructure. And we want to make money. <laughs> Doesn't sound good, does it? <coughs> All right. There's more competition. There are more universities. China builds universities at a rate you wouldn't believe at present. They are creating a new city every year and universities to go with it. We used to have a global higher education system where Australia made money from international students. Our international student income dropped by 25% about three years ago. Ouch, all right? So we have a university that is keen to find ways to cut the costs of teaching. Keen to find ways to make teaching more effective and efficient. But the real game changer has not been things like technology, people talk about that. It's been the idea that nature, the nature of knowledge has fundamentally changed in the last 20 years. It is absolutely impossible to know everything about anything. All you can know about is the uncertainty of knowing everything. Today's graduates are not faced with the problem that beset medical graduates where we just needed to make the course longer and longer to cover more and more content, and finally said, we can't do that, we'll teach with problem-based learning instead. Now we have to teach them the fact that there are 20 different problem-solving ways that will work, and not any one of them is going to be right, because someone else will have a different world view. People have been writing for two decades at least about the uncertainty of the modern world, the super complexity of the modern world, Universities need to educate students for that super complex, uncertain world. That means we need to fundamentally change what we teach and the way we teach it. Otherwise, no matter how cheaply we do it, we will not be doing anything that is of any use to anybody. So there is a fundamental pedagogical driver that means universities need to think seriously about teaching. When you add that to the financial drivers, you get a real level of interest that is quite different. It is not surprising the German government has invested as much money as it has in educational change. It needs to. All right. We could go on about that for about six hours. Um, number two, there is an increasing level of expertise. The people at my university and many universities in Australia have learnt about teaching for about 40 years now. They've, many of them have got qualifications in university teaching. They've all been trained in our orientation programs. They've started to read the literature. We have done a good job of educating them. Many of them know how to ask questions about their teaching. And of course, they're academics, so they know how to read and study and find out about it. There's a level of expertise in our teachers which is quite different. There is also a level of depth of expertise. People like me, who were a speech pathologist and worked in neuropsych and aphasiology, but were fascinated by learning, have become the higher education research experts two decades later. So 20 years worth of research and study about higher education, I've moved from being an amateur to being someone who publishes research in this area. But at the same time, when I was the lone amateur in my department 20 years ago, Everyone in that department are now very clever amateurs. So there is a level of breadth of expertise that has changed, and there is a level of depth of expertise that has changed. That means there is so much more resource for us to work with. The last thing that's changed, though, is there is a new sophistication in leadership and management. People like me are becoming deputy vice-chancellors. 
we are making decisions about the changes in universities based on a different knowledge base. And we're doing it in quite different ways. One of the things that I noticed at my university was things really started to change when we got our first pro-vice-chancellor teaching and learning. And he was a funny guy called Paul Ramsden. So he was in a very, very gifted amateur at that stage. It was a long time ago. But Paul started to change the university in ways that no other deputy vice-chancellor or pro-vice-chancellor had done. Our leadership is different. I have deans that I taught on their first induction training at the University of Sydney on teaching, who are now deans and making decisions. In some cases, those deans went through and did every qualification that we had on offer. So they are very well-educated leaders. It's a different situation. But the thing that you cannot escape is the idea that we need to fundamentally transform learning. There are many multiple worlds out there. Our graduates need to thrive in them. All right, end of the first part. <coughs> so there's a really good reason for change. <coughs> Second thing I want to talk about. Why is it that change has usually failed? What I want to do here is draw on a research project that um, gathered data across the 39 publicly funded universities in Australia. We interviewed about 200 people all up. And we have talked to them about educational change related to a particular issue, which was the idea of curriculum renewal to achieve those sorts of graduate learning outcomes. Universities in Australia and England in particular have funded this sort of work for about 20 years. And in the UK, they had funded it at that stage, the last time I looked, to the tune of about 28 billion pounds. Wow. That's a lot of money. You'd kind of expect there to be some dramatic changes, wouldn't you? No. Nah. <laughs> the government had funded educational change hugely. But if you looked for change in any measure of student outcome, in terms of the quality of their experiences, the nature of their outcomes, their employer satisfaction, there was nothing like the sort of change that you would expect to see as a return on that sort of investment. That was one of my first research projects, was looking at why is that? As part of that research, I got to the stage of asking, what's the problem with institutions that is like this? And what I found was that there are, and we sort of basically were asking the question of what makes for an effective institutional change strategy? And we talked to the deputy vice chancellors we talked to the directors of the educational development units. We talked to the academics who taught. And we started to get a story about the things that worked. And at the heart of that story was something that anyone who'd worked in organisational change or organisational research knew for a long time. In fact, there was this guy called Deming, W. Edwards Deming, who basically said, 94% of the problems of organisations are systems driven. Only 6% are about the people. All right, he was a great American. I'll show you a photo in a second. <laughs> but that kind of makes you think. And this wasn't, he wasn't looking at universities. He was looking at other organisations. But it's got to make you think. A university, a really complex organisation. As staff developers, we work with the people, not the systems. I wonder if we're working with the right part of the puzzle. The 6% or the 84%. So this is kind of where we were coming from. What we did was we interviewed those people and we asked them about the parts of the system that they saw as helping their work, getting in the way of their work. And we came up with this model. And there's a website that I can, you can go and have a look at all the papers on this. But I'll just tell you a little bit about the bits in the model, because I think it's helpful to think about. So can I say this was a model we developed looking at that particular graduate attributes-led curriculum renewal work? I've used this when I look at technology uptake. I've used this when I look at why people's efforts to engage in curriculum change of any sort haven't worked. I've looked at it in terms of teacher education programs, and it's always the same. The same pieces come out. 
it kind of works. Um, when you're thinking about a system, there are some pieces of the puzzle that always have to be lined up. The major piece is that somewhere in the, w in the puzzle, there has to be a clear vision, a clear set of ideas about what you are doing and why you are doing it. Yet it is amazing how often that is not clear. Universities say, we are transforming education, or we are going to renew our curriculum. And you say to them, what do you mean? We're going to renew our curriculum. No, what do you mean by renew? And what do you mean by curriculum? And they'd have no idea. There's a complete lack of clarity behind Elvie's vision statements. It's, that's the same as all the research on conceptions of learning, isn't it? Oh, well, students learn. Students understand. What do you mean understand? Understand means lots of different things. So there's a lack of clarity about the conceptions and the ideas that drive these systems. The second thing, there's a level above that, which is you can have some great ideas, but unless you've actually engaged the whole university community with those ideas, you have no idea if people even understand them, let alone sign up for them. You have no idea that the people who are the professors sign up to it differently to the people who are the assistant professors. You have no idea that the students have a completely different take on it to everybody. The parents of those students, another set of ideas again. Universities so often have great ideas, we're good at that, we're not very good at engaging our university communities with those ideas. And that's often a failing of leaders. So there's a level of engaging the stakeholders which is often missing. You'd be amazed how many universities have an idea about transforming education but have absolutely no strategy about how they are going to do that. They kind of just expect it will happen. Not only do they not have a strategy, they often don't find the thing that makes a strategy work, which is the resources and the funding for that strategy. Those are kind of basic organisational change things. You need to have an idea, you need to communicate it, you need a strategy for implementing it. The next piece of this pyramid, the four uprights, are what we ended up referring to as the enabling strategies. And you need all four. Staff development, so the idea of professional learning. How do you actually engage the people who work in this system in learning about how to make the change you want? The two in the middle, the curriculum, because we're talking about teaching and learning, and so often the curriculum gets in the way. All right? We decide we are going to foster, you know, collaborative interdisciplinary learning. And we have a curriculum that says if you're studying this course, you have a three-point elective. That is the only thing you are allowed to do outside of the faculty. Yes, we have a commitment to transdisciplinary learning. No, the curriculum gets in the way. So the idea of the structures of the curriculum, the other curriculum is the next column, assessment. It's so often that we say, yes, we value problem-based learning and risk-taking in students. And then we have an assessment that says, you will fail if you get anything wrong. Do not take risks. <laughs> All right? And the last one, which is kind of the assessment for the university, quality assurance. These days, everything is measured, monitored, managed. What we measure matters. It's one thing to say to a teacher, I want you to teach in this particular way, Daniel. But it's another thing if I say I'm going to measure something quite different and I'm going to promote you on what I measure. Which one is he going to do? The thing that I tell him is a good idea or the thing that is going to get him promoted? The thing that's going to get him promoted. Just like students, we ask what's in the test. We want to know what it is that we need to do to succeed. That's normal. So quality assurance. The last part of the puzzle was the idea that unless it actually fundamentally has an impact on students, then all of these systems and structures don't work. What was really interesting is when you take those pieces of the puzzle and you look at almost any organisational change strategy, you say, which one of these is missing? 
Or which one of these is out of alignment with the idea that you're trying to achieve? It's pretty easy to see why organisational change fails. How can you expect a staff development strategy to renew curriculum if there is no clear message from the top about what it is? If it's not set up in a way that is going to be rewarded by the institution's quality assurance systems? If the curriculum structures and assessment design won't let it happen? There are so many ways the system falls apart. It kind of made me feel a bit better as an academic developer when I could work out that it wasn't that I wasn't doing my stuff right. It was the fact that I was doing it in a system that was quite inimical to me doing that. And I suddenly started to see where I needed to put my efforts. I needed to start to change the system rather than just do my academic development. My first message to LV academic developers in the room, if you keep working on the 6%, not the 84%, you will not have a job when the funding runs out. <laughs> this is Mr Deming. <laughs> He's been saying this for a long time. This is one of his other favourite quotes. Learning is not compulsory, but nor is survival. <laughs> I think academic developers could take a lot from that. <laughs> um, so, end of so far, we've got an idea that we want to start using university systems to make new learning possible. If it was only that simple. What I want to do now is move to another, introduce a different idea. How many times have you, as a teacher who loves teaching or an academic developer, bemoaned the fact that research is always thought of as more important. Research always trumps teaching. If only teaching was equal to research. We all say it, don't we? We all want it. Yet we continue to perpetuate this binary system that somehow puts teaching and research in opposition to each other. A long time ago, about 1992, people started to come up with some different ideas about this, and I want to share one of those today. It was an idea about how we might move beyond teaching and research to the idea of scholarship, and as scholarship being the defining feature of academic practice. It's where this phrase, the scholarship of teaching and learning, comes from. And it's a phrase that has been bandied about a little bit, shall I say, and is probably a bit unclear, and I want to just touch on a few things. Um, it's only one idea. I could have picked any one of about 15 other ideas. But the important thing about this idea is it is a way of moving past the teaching versus research divide, which makes it so difficult for us as academics to engage in our teaching in the same way that we engage in our research. Some of my current research is looking at how you change the doctoral program so that students leave a PhD with the same passion for engaging in teaching as they have for engaging in research. That's assuming their PhD hasn't killed their passion for engaging in research. <laughs> I think we have a fundamental challenge on our hands there. Anyway, um, this was an idea that came from the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of University Teaching. Um, a gentleman called Ernest Boyer was the first sort of origin of this particular version of this. It's had many different versions. But Boyer had this really neat idea. This is a neat idea that said, let's stop talking about teaching and research as the tasks or activities of academia. Instead, let's talk about the different types of scholarship that we might engage in. And he came up with four scholarships. At the top of this picture, you'll see something called the scholarship of discovery. The scholarship of discovery is very much like what we traditionally call research. It is about discovering new knowledge, finding new things that add to the sum of human knowledge, creating new concepts, constructs, theories, ideas fairly familiar stuff. You go across to the right, there's a new scholarship, the Scholarship of Application. This is a scholarship that says, 
it's no good just creating new ideas and constructs and theories. You've got to somehow take those out into the world and make them do stuff. They have to do work. And in their doing of their work, they change. They are applied. Translational research, that idea that we take the research and we make it do things, is a different type of scholarship. Over on the left-hand side, he came up with another idea about scholarship, which he called the scholarship of integration, which I think is what I do as a vet, speech pathologist, neuropsychologist, educational researcher. You take ideas from lots of places and you put them together. And when you put them together, hey presto, you have a different idea. That idea that research that exists between disciplines is often the site of new knowledge now. We get new knowledge by taking very familiar ideas and putting them next to each other. The scholarship of integration. And then down the bottom, the real beauty. The scholarship of teaching and learning. This was an idea that we don't think of teaching as anything other than a different form of scholarship. It's about taking ideas and making sure that other people understand those ideas. It's about making sure that we think about the methodology by which we do that as being just and sound and accurate. So we think about how we do that in exactly the same scholarly ways that we would approach the scholarship of discovery. In exactly the same scholarly way that I think about my integration of different ideas. The thing that holds all of those, and they're, they're continuing, so there is a, a movement between the different scholarships, and in some ways, some of those dimensions are logical extremes of a continuum. But the thing that, is, the thing that holds them all together is this idea of scholarship. And the idea of scholarship was defined in terms of three key features. And if you just close your eyes and think about research, these kind of make sense. They make as much sense about teaching. The idea that the work must be made public for it to be scholarly, if it stays locked in our own head, that research doesn't really matter, does it? It has to be made public, it has to be got out there. It's the same with teaching. Teaching can no longer happen behind closed doors. You know, it's this idea that we need to somehow open it up. That opening up means that we open it up for something in particular, which is the idea of critique peer review. We encourage our colleagues to poke holes in our ideas. And we ask them to do that according to some accepted standards. So it's not just, I don't like that. It's like, no, as a peer reviewer for this paper, Simon, tell me why. Tell me what standards it doesn't meet. We do that with our scholarship of discovery work very well. We need to do it with our teaching work in the same way. And the last one is a nice one. The idea that it can be reproduced, built on, extended. The ideas that we make public about our teaching and that we critique so that they are rigorous can be used by others. If you thought about teaching in your university in terms of those three things, I'll bet it would look very different, very different. If I had teachers who were basically going out there and talking about their teaching very publicly with other teachers, if there was peer critique of that conversation and discussion according to some standards and some rigour, and if the people who were involved in that took those ideas back into their own classrooms and improved their work, I could retire. I could retire. That's a sustaining system of change that would mean the teachers who were doing the teaching were continuously learning, they were continuously improving, they were talking about it, there was buzz, there was energy. I would have half my job done. I certainly wouldn't have to pay attention to the 6%. What I would have to do is pay attention to the 84% to make sure that was possible. How would I create a university where that's what it would be like? When I ask people about what that would be like, 
and they usually write down their words. This is the sort of stuff that comes out. Everyone goes, wow, it'd be sustainable. It would be fun, all right? It would be engaging. It would feel like a university. All the things that we bemoan teaching doesn't do. It's kind of radical. All right, I'm going to skip over this one. There is an idea, we can come back to it. The idea that there are, of course, extremes and sort of localizations of that. So the common thing is about this idea of, you know, the different levels of scholarship of teaching. You don't all have to become educational researchers. Educational researchers would be about the scholarship of discovery. It would be about the things that I do, which is trying to generate those new concepts that will be used around the world. If I want to engage in the scholarship of teaching and learning, I don't have to make every teacher an educational researcher. In fact, if the aim of scholarship of teaching is to improve practice, there are far better ways for people to share and make public their work than writing a journal article. They are better off going into their staff room and talking about it. They are better off talking at a university teaching and learning event like this, where they share their practice and their colleagues get to listen. The important thing about this, though, is that the teachers themselves become the change agents. And you would achieve that not by putting them through a lot of courses on university teaching, but by changing the way we conceive about teaching. You start to change the bottom level of that system. And through that, you would fundamentally change the university. Easier said than done, of course. Right, so far we have three possible ways we can think this through. We want to think differently about teaching and maybe work through a university system. We still want to transform learning. And as academic developers, that's kind of our job. That's a bit like my job description, isn't it? I want the university to think differently about teaching. I want them to do it in a way that is going to make sense of the university systems. But really, I've got to transform learning. So, learning. I want to talk about some ideas about learning that I think would be very helpful for academic developers. And there are two places, I suppose, that I would suggest we might look. One is the research on academic development. When you go and look at the research on academic development, research, not scholarship of teaching and learning, research, there's not a lot of it. But there is some, and what it has to say is fascinating. One of the reasons I get to play in this space is because I have PhD students at our unit that are doing PhDs on academic development. I have staff whose PhDs are on academic development, and that's kind of the way we work. So we have a very different scholarly tradition around <laughs> academic development. But even I have to say, there's not a lot of research out there. We need to do more research on academic development. It's a gaping hole in our research culture at present. But what there is, is a lot of research on learning. And it's different sorts of research. There is a fascinating body of research around the sociology of universities which I find incredibly rich and very helpful when I think about academic development. There's a huge body of research on professional learning, how people in the professions learn. There's a huge body of research, as I mentioned, from our friend Deming and others on organisational learning. And of course, there's a huge body of research on student learning. Yet one of the things I often ask when I do consultancy work with academic development units is, Robert, tell me what the research principles and theories are that underpin your programs. And it's one of the questions I ask people when I interview them for jobs at our place. Take note. Tell me about the theories that you think most usefully inform your design of academic development. A number of times, people who are very experienced just go, I have no idea. I've just been doing this. I train people. What do you mean there's a theory? Right. So, some of the ideas that I think are useful. But before we do that, I'm going to ask you to do something. 
Up there are three of the most commonly seen ways that academic developers work in terms of working on learning. The first is this idea of formal curricula, formal courses be they short, be they long, workshops, programs, etc. The second one is this idea of kind of social learning, the notion that people learn through networks, through their engagement with their colleagues, through mentoring, through peer discussions. And the last one is this very commonly held idea that people learn by doing. You learn by getting engaged in a project, doing the innovations. All right. Show of hands. I want to know which one is the most effective in terms of enhancing institutional teaching and learning. Which one? Show of hands for number one. No one thinks number one's the most effective. <laughs> hmm, fascinating. Number two. Ah. Number three. Ah. Interesting. Numbers two and three, but not number one. Where do academic developers put most of their effort? <laughs> number one. <laughs> yes? Actually, the answer is none of the above. You need all three. You need all three. But the thing that really makes it a kicker is that the thing that is most effective in enhancing institutional, institutional, that key word, learning, is number two. One of the PhDs that was recently completed in my department was a student who did a PhD on the academic development potential of informal conversations in departments. One of the things that is really clear is that as expert academics, we learn most from the very subtle very local conversations we have with colleagues. And we learn dependent on two things, the extent to which we trust that person and the extent to which we see that person as significant. If you can get to the trusted significant others in departments, their conversations will do more to change teaching and learning than anything else you can do, anything else. All right, here are what I see are the five headlines that come from some of the research, and there's just a couple of little you know, references if you want to follow those up. Academics learning is unbounded, all right? Like everyone else, we learn all the time. We certainly don't learn in a formal nine to five at work in a training room. We learn on the bus, we learn talking to our mates at the pub, we learn by watching the things that people like me say, we learn all sorts of ways but it's a very informal, amorphous learning, and it's the most powerful. At its best, academic practice is about authentic identity. It's about us as academics becoming the people we want to be. How much of our learning is about authentic identity formation in academic development courses? In fact, if you think about an authentic identity, it wouldn't be a split identity between research and teaching, would it? It would be an integrated identity. But how many of our academic development programs about teaching are about integrated academic practice and therefore addressing research as well as teaching? We insist on splitting them up. How often do we forget that the person sitting there is an individual who's going to go back to a department where there's a really nasty bully of a boss and have to hold up these ideas? How much of the identity do we let lead into our work when we try and have a consistent training program for the 3,000 new staff? Identity is a missing piece. Managerialism. There's a lot of people who've been writing about this and I think it's very important. Managerialism in universities in Australia, maybe not in Germany, is increasingly positioning academics as stakeholders to be consulted. However, those stakeholders have very little agency to actually affect change. They are asked for their opinion, their opinion is quietly massaged or ignored, and they don't actually get to do much. Academic developers are much the same. 
So often we are infantilized in terms of the way that we are sitting back and waiting for management to tell us what to do. We don't actually go out there with an agenda of change very often. I think there is something about managerialism, the way people are writing about it, which is fundamentally important for learning. Of course, the idea that work or practice is learning is not a new one. Work integrated learning. How do you actually make work the opportunity and site for learning about teaching and learning? It's the thing that is the most rich source, yet we don't use it. Learning is shaped by local cultures. Um, my colleague Torgny Roxma is very good at this. The idea that the sort of learning that happens at that very local interactive department or individual context changes anything that happens at a system. Those are common research ideas. One thing we did at Sydney was we took those and we wrote a professional rationale for our academic development programs. Those are the five things that we put up there. And those are now part of our university professional development framework that I basically argued with the Vice-Chancellor and the Deputy Vice-Chancellor about. We still haven't finished it, it's a work in progress. But these are the things that I said, you need to realise, this is what the research tells me is important about the way professional learning about teaching is going to happen at this university. I want you to agree to this and sign up to it so that we don't ever have to have the conversation again about the value or the way we do it. Because there is one thing university bosses love to do, which is to tell us how to do academic development. You're welcome to have those later. So, I'm gonna leave you with a challenge. The challenge as I see it is, can we reframe teaching? Can we harness the university system to transform learning? And how might we have to transform academic development to do so. And I will stop there so we have some time for questions. Thank you.